Okay, so I'm going to talk today about religion and science and their interface. I am a scientist with an active research lab, but I also am an Orthodox Christian, and how those two interface to me is a very important thing. I have four key points that I want to make to you today, and you're going to hear these themes coming through as I talk. The first is that science has limits. It has limits in what it can study, and it has limits in what we can understand from science. The second is that science is one way of looking at the world, but it's not the only way. And as my reference for that point, I often use Francisco Ayala, who said, science is a way of knowing, but is not the only way. Knowledge also derives from other sources, such as common sense, artistic and religious experience, and philosophical reflection. Francisco Ayala is both a Roman Catholic scholar and a scientist. My third point is that in the religion science dialogue, there are extremists on both sides and that we need to beware of those extremists. And my fourth point will be science and religion share many features together and we need to understand those. Okay, so let's start with the limitations of science. There are many lists that you can find in academic catalogs, particularly that are told to science scientists, but the two, that are, two of the ones that are most important are that they're measurable, science has to be measurable and repeatable. What does that mean? In most examples for science, we must be able to measure our results, to quantitate. So even if we're looking at a cell under a microscope, we need to be able to quantitate how many cells look that way. Otherwise, we can't get through what science actually does. The second key point about it being repeatable is that it has to be repeatable in time and space. That means I do it in my home lab in Chicago, Illinois, and guess what? Somebody else in Russia or China or somebody else in the world, someplace else in the world, has to be able to find exactly the same thing. It needs to be repeatable in time so that an investigator looking 10 years from now will get the same results that we get in our laboratory now today. The second key point with regard to the limitations of science, or the second limitation of science, is that beliefs may cloud judgments. A lot of people want to believe that science is a very uh, objective uh, approach. And it is objective in some ways, but we are influenced by our surroundings. Scientists are influenced by what is going on in the culture. And I'm going to tell a story in a few minutes that will illustrate that point. Science cannot deal with values and morals. Now, I might try to approach my science using ethical standards, using moral approaches, but science won't tell me what's ethical. People have to make decisions about what's ethical and what's moral. Finally, science can describe, but it can't really explain. What do we mean by explain? Well, when you ask somebody to explain something, you're normally asking them, why are you doing this? Science doesn't really talk about the why so much. It talks more about the what and the how. And this is the story of where do babies come from? Now, we all know how this story ends. I like to call this story the story of the frog's little pants. So when did we first discover in the scientific community where babies come from? This will shock many people. 1875. Civil War had already been fought. Light bulb would only be discovered in a year or two from then. This is very late in scientific development for such a fundamental issue. Why did it take so long? It's because there were fundamental flaws in how society thought about what women do and what men do. The general way in which women were, were thought about at that time was, and this is actually written in text, the woman is a field and the man plants the baby seeds. And the woman, her only job is to carry those baby seeds to full fruition and actually have babies. This led to a lot of inappropriate attitudes toward women. Um, concubines were considered to be acceptable in many cultures because why? Women could, men could have as many fields as they wanted to have. Um, rape was frequently excused and not even considered a crime in many cultures. Why? Because men could plant their seeds wherever they wanted. This attitude led to a denigrating of women, but it also led in science to an extreme difficulty in trying to figure out where babies came from because there was a prejudice. The prejudice was that the male did everything and the woman was just a receptacle to carry the baby. 
So now we get to my frogs and little pants story. Spallanzani, in 1740, was working in Italy. He was a scientist, and he actually was somewhat innovative. He, in the beginning, he would take male frogs and female frogs, and guess what? He got babies. He took female frogs, but he took male frogs where he sewed little pants on them, and he threw those frogs in with the female frogs, and guess what? There were no babies. But then he did the innovative thing. He took the pants off the frogs. Rub them onto the genitals of the female frog, and guess what? He got babies. This was the first time that it was shown that men did not be have to be present in order to have babies. The next, maybe important discovery was Van Leeuwenhoek, who found the microscope. He looked at what was in the frog's pants, and what did he discover? He discovered something that was very small. No babies here, he said. What did he find? He found sperm. But he said these can't be important; these are parasites. So even still, the, the prejudice persisted, and it wasn't until 1875 when Hertwig took sea urchin eggs, which are really pretty large. He added sperm to them, and he saw them start to divide right under his own microscope. That's when it was first discovered how babies were formed. This was a very, very long time in coming. We knew a lot of other things about the human body before then, but that prejudice about about how women were were, were、um, supposed to behave, what women's role was, that was what influenced this and created this problem. Now, I want to go back and at least say that those influences, you know, think about church canons that talk about. Uh, pregnancy, conception—all of these were based on a false understanding of how this act takes place. So decisions were made that were not based at all on science, were not based at all on facts, but were based on preconceived ideas. So the lessons from the story are: guess what? We are influenced by our culture, and it's true for the church, and it's true for science as well. Okay. My next point I want to make is that there are extremists on both sides. In science, we have extremists who accept that the only way of understanding the world is through science, and that the only explanation for the natural world is through science. That's scientism. It's an extreme perspective. It's not. It's not thought by most scientists, but it certainly is very common. I think in the religious community we have extremists who. Want to take everything literally. They want to take every word exactly as it's written. They want to take every word that comes out of the priest's mouth as being absolutely accurate. They have this approach toward literalism, and that too is an extreme perspective. In general, extremist views are divisive, and they eliminate diverse opinions. It is very hard to argue with somebody that says this word it says everything I need to know when. How do you come up with even an alternate interpretation? Because it's not the interpretation that's important; it's what the word is important. Extremists also eliminate opportunities for open discussion, and this can lead to problems、um, within any community and in the broad religion science dialogue. But there is a unity and a relationship between religion and science. Both religion and science accept. That there may be more to the story than they understand. In religion, we think a lot about、um, what more there is that contributes to our faith, what more there is that we understand and we can think about. And and from science, we often know that there's yet another experiment to be done, yet another thing. And there are some things we may not understand for a very long time because they're complex or they require technologies we don't have yet today. I like to also talk about the. The, the mentorship model. Both religion and science work on this mentorship model. What does that mean? When a student comes into my lab and they want to work with me, I don't care about textbooks anymore. I don't care about all the facts. I care about training them to be a good scientist. They train with me as their mentor. I guide them through on how to become a good scientist, step by step by step. We work through their errors, we work through their faults, and we work through the good things that happen as well. And I believe that's the case for religion. I mean, we actually have a spiritual director who is whose job it is and responsibility it is to help us work through our spiritual issues. 
The test of success for both is not an exam. My students' success is not based on whether they pass an exam one day, it's based on how good a scientist they become. The test for success for our faith is about how good a Christian you become. Science and religion have had an influence on our culture and our culture has had an influence on it. But there's one other final common point I want to talk about that is common to religion and science, and that is creativity. Creativity is a process where somehow something new and valuable is formed. It could be it can be intangible like an idea or a concept. It could be tangible like an artwork or a, a work of literature. So it could be physical or non-physical. Um, it is an important aspect of human endeavor. Um, and when I think about it from a lab perspective, I think sometimes about the spark that gives rise to a new idea that nobody had before, where somebody does an experiment that's never been done, where somebody does something that's very, very original. For my own personal life, I often think about creativity in, when I'm sitting in, in, in liturgy, I hear a gospel reading 50 times. And the 51st time, I hear something different in it that I never heard before. There's a spark of creativity that comes with that, a spark of understanding, of insight that I didn't have before. Where does creativity come from? It can't be commanded. It is often spontaneous, and it, it is not, it can be both emotional and cognitive. It can be only emotional, only cognitive. I cannot tell my students, go into the lab today and be creative, because creativity is not commanded. Um, Christian scholars, many Christian scholars of the years, have seen the creativity of, our, of, of God, the creation, creative work of God, of God the creator, and have said that human creativity is somehow an icon or an image of that creativity of the creator. If we see that as being the case, then, that, then, then we must see then that the, our own creative work is a gift from God, from God the creator. So my closing point then is that there are dangers with extremism. By being closed to new ideas, by being resistant to diverse concepts, we often block out our creativity. We, and, and since this creativity is an icon of God and the creator's action, we limit our participation in God's creativity. I believe that right now today, we especially need creative solutions in the life of the church. We need to return to the creativity that the early church fathers had when they were dealing with their problems. Thank you.